Hiya, my name is Stacey Townsend and I am the founder of Pickler, where we help you learn to play better pickleball. I am also the co-host of Pickler the Podcast, along with my favorite mixed doubles partner, John, the people's champ, Davison. And John, it's our first episode of 2022. I know, it's exciting stuff. We're gonna have a big year, Stace. I, I believe in us. I think so too. And I think pickleball as a sport will also have a big year because mm -hmm. we're what? nine days into the new year and lots of things are happening, especially in the pro world, uh, which we will certainly talk about in this episode today. Yeah, there's been a lot going on in the last 24 hours, right? <laughs> With both tours, uh, very active on Facebook, making a lot of announcements. So it's been been pretty entertaining for sure. Well, I think we should break it down just to make sure everybody's caught up and up to speed with the latest because you're right things are changing by the minute in the pro pickleball landscape right now so to take it back uh there was two pro tours we have app and ppa who started just before covid made it through covid had their first full season and were ready to go again in 2022 and what happened at the end of 2021 is this gentleman named tom dundon of dundon capital invested in pretty much all of pickleball, took a majority stake in Pickleball Central, which is the largest retailer in the sport, pickleballtournaments.com, which is the largest software provider in the sport for pickleball tournaments across the world. And also the PPA, which is probably up into, at least up until now, the biggest pro tour in the sport. Uh, and from there, some things started to happen. Yeah. So, uh, what, 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 I mean, APP responded, right. And APP and major league pickleball came into an agreement. I guess there was a falling out between MLP and PPA. Um, I'm yeah, not exactly so, sure what happened there. Maybe, I don't know. Well, I think it all started with the pro player contracts. There was mm -hmm. some noise that the PPA were was asking the top pro players to sign three-year exclusivities where they could only play PPAs. So obviously the competing tours had a issue with that because they wouldn't have any players playing in their events, which would be the APP, the competing tour, as well as Major League Pickleball, MLP. We have a lot of acronyms going on today. And... Uh, PPA and MLP tried to hash it out, didn't go so well. So now MLP is on the APP side of the fence and we have what seems to be two competing pro tours for the same players, for the same sport and uh, maybe a little bit of bad blood mixed in. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody should be surprised that there's this competition between the two tours, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's business. Each one is trying to get their piece of the pie, right? And um, I kind of like to, my thoughts are, I like to compare it right now, where the sport is now and where I feel like it's going to go, is that both tours are going to exist for a while, at least for the foreseeable future over the next few years. But I, I feel like it's starting to look like uh, the MMA world, mixed martial arts. I don't know how familiar you are with that, Stacey. But, um, you know, you have a couple big uh, organizations. You have the UFC, you have Bellator, um, Pride One, and a couple others. And they're competing for their fighters, right? And they're each getting individual contracts, you know, say four fights, right? And that would be like a year or two. And they can't go and fight in these other organizations. And I feel like it's starting to get in that way for pickleball. And I don't think it's always necessarily a bad thing because when you get the competition between the two tours, you're going to see that the players hopefully are going to start getting more money because of it, right? Because the tours need the players more than the players need the tours at this point, right? So I feel like as long as the players um, are treated fairly and at the end of the day, if the players are getting more money and can earn a better living, then I like to see the competition between the two tours. 
No, I think you're right. I mean, there's only only so many pro pickleball players, right? So they're in some high demand at the. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting and great for the sport is we have Tom Dundun, who is basically a billionaire and wanting to in, go all in and invest in all these pickleball businesses. On the other hand, Major League Pickleball, uh, who's on the APP side, is run by a couple billionaires themselves who have invested millions of dollars already into the sport. So with all that type of capital being invested, I mean, it's only it can only mean good things for the sport of pickleball and its growth. Uh, you just hope that everybody has the same goal in mind, which is doing what's best for the the sport. I, I, to your point, the pro players are certainly in the driver's seat, uh, and hopefully we'll have a lot of opportunity coming out of out of this. Yeah, I mean, and it doesn't just come down to money either. It's how they're treated, mm -hmm. right? Um, which tour can give them the best advertising and marketing for sponsors to come in and sponsor those players? Right. It's going to come down to how they're treated at tournaments, um, just how the tournaments are run in general. Uh, so the tours have a lot of work cut out for them. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be good for the players. I would suggest at this point, if you're a pro player in the top 20, top 30, and you don't have management already, I feel like they're starting to get enough money and skin in the game with all these contracts that they really need to be looking for good player management, you know, to help them maneuver through some of these deals um, and get and make the best out of their career. I know you're a lawyer, so I'm sure you, um, you like that area of the sport. Yeah, you're, you're, you're speaking my, uh, my tune, I suppose as, as a lawyer, you're totally right. Like you never know what's buried in a contract. You it's, it's sometimes very hard to read and understand and think about all the ins and outs of how it can affect you. And especially when you're talking about three years, when the sport is changing so rapidly, you know, we, we were saying the landscape has changed so much in the last 24 hours. So think about three years, what it's going to be. Uh, it's, it's hard to navigate, like you said, and you really need to have a team around you looking out for your best interest. So we hope the the pros are taking that all into account. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, I really just don't want the players to be taken advantage of, right? So I love to see the competition between the two tours, but as long as they're putting the players first at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I think it can only get better for the players um and then you know you have the amateur side as well because until big money starts coming in which is starting to the amateurs are paying a lot of the way right they're the ones that are helping the tours make the money on the you know on the weekend right, right. to cover all the costs and so as of right now, you really need to also focus on not just the pros, but the amateurs and make sure that they have a good experience as well. Because if you were to lose the amateurs, then it might get a little expensive just having the pro pro only at the moment, right? Until you start getting some big corporate sponsors come in and paying the bills. No, but that's a good point. I don't, I don't think we're there yet, right? No, yeah, you're right. And that that's a great point. Pickleball, you know, 1% of the pickleball population are tournament players, even less are the pros. We love talking about them because they're exciting and there's a lot going on. But amateurs are really driving the bus. What I'm curious also is how the APP will position themselves going forward. So to date, the PPA has largely positioned themselves as the pro event. They are very focused on the pros, maybe less so on the amateurs or the senior pros versus the APP, you know, they focus on every player. Right. They believe the senior pros, the amateurs and the pros should all be treated well and have a great experience. So it'll be interesting to see if APP shifts at all with aligning with MLP. My sense is probably not uh, just because that they're have a really strong value uh, in Come play where everyone everyone plays, but it will be interesting to see if there's a bit of a culture shift. Yeah, well, I mean, I think both tours do a great job in their own right, 
and I feel like both tours also need to do better jobs in other areas, right? Um, but it's only been what a year and a half, two years tops. I feel like I feel like COVID kind of dunted. It was right when both these tours started. They started in like the same month. I feel like, mm -hmm. um, and so still in its infancy. But I think this year will be very telling. I don't know how it's going to go um, or what the opinions are going to be, but I feel like there's going to be a lot of changes and a lot of, um, I feel like it's going to be a lot clearer at the end of this year where the two tours stand. But I think there's room for both. So we'll see. I, I think that's right. We will see is probably the best line coming out of this. Uh, so far, it sounds like they are ready to go head to head though. MLP aligned with APP and a day later, the PPA announced they will do a, a team event, which is sounds to be uh, somewhat of a copycat of MLP. So there will be some head to head battle. Yeah, there will. And I mean, the MLP, as you know, I said on an earlier podcast, I thought the MLP was the coolest thing that happened in pickleball so far. But I, you know, um, talking with a couple of other people about this, and it really, the, the top players may not like that format all the time, right? Because, and because they don't have control over the result, right? So I think, you know, a couple of things could happen. You can have that draft thing once or twice a year, and it would be exciting because you get a whole bunch of different matchups. But I also feel like the players might push back and be like, no, we want our own team. And then you're going to have players building out their own teams, right? So I don't know where it's going to go, honestly. But I, I think you're going to see, some, you know, both tours trying – you know, the MLP and APP trying different things in that format, as well as the PPA now basically copying it, even though I guess the idea is not proprietary, right? But mm -hmm. um, it's the, you can't have too much of it, right? Because it loses its its um, excitement value. Well, that's another point, right? We're we're talking about having at least one pro tournament every weekend in 2022. So how will that shape the pro pickleball landscape? Will you have, you know, frankly, some boredom of it? Or will they be able to keep it fresh and exciting with different twists or partnerships, matchups, et cetera? That's going to be an interesting story for 2022, I think, as well. Yeah. And, and hopefully there's not a burnout among the players. I feel like that's one thing about, you know, players sticking to uh, one tour that's beneficial to them, right? Because, I mean, you even saw a few players last year. Uh, Jay Duvillier um, was one of them. Lauren Stratman, Leia, uh, Zane Navratil, right? Some of those players, they played almost every single weekend. And at one point, you could almost see it in Jay uh, Duvillier when they did, when they had the um, the back to back to back to back weekends out in California, you could just tell how gassed he was, right? Because he's playing three, four days a week at a tournament level all day long, you know. So it gives the players a little more of a um, a break between weekends. But the good news is, is if you don't sign with either one of them, you can do that, and you can rack up a bunch of money, you yes. know. So there's two different ways you can go about it, which is, I think, fun and exciting. Um, and hopefully we get to see a lot of different matchups because of that. No, that's true. And and I believe like players like Corinne Carr took mm -hmm. self, uh, they, they self-imposed some time away because it was, a. you saw maybe some more injuries this year because people were playing more. I, yeah. I know probably most amateurs or rec players could play every day, if not twice a day, but the tournament space, it's a different grind mentally and physically. So it, it is a lot on these pro players to endure. If they play that many or both tours like they did last year. Yeah. I mean, and it's not just the, um, I mean, we could all play three, four hours a day, but the pros at the top level are playing six, seven, eight hours a day. And it's not just the physical toll of the long points, but also just the mental toll really impacts the body, 
And that's why you see good athletes like Tyson McGuffin, who's like, you know, comes from a wrestling background and he still cramps up sometimes and his body just quits on him because it's just that grind, right? And the mental, the mental toll and being able to stay in those points for a long time, all day long, every weekend, it takes a big toll on the players. So that's just one reason why I, I think you know, players can pick one or pick the other or do both, right? It's really up you're to gonna them. Have, yeah, and you're going to have players in different camps, right, with different philosophies on how they want to treat this year or what works best for them. But I think the key takeaways are there's a ton of money being pumped into the sport, which hopefully means more visibility, more opportunity, and more growth. Yeah, I think both tours have committed over $2 million this year, right? So that's... I mean, when you, as you'll see in our, in the next segment we go into, um, you'll see that pickleball has come a very, very long way in every aspect. Right. Um, and it's just good. It's just going to keep growing. And I hope that we're not even close to the ceiling and that everyone's just going to be making money. You're going to be making it rain. Well, maybe pickleball will be America's new favorite pastime. That's what we want. Continue the growth. Hopefully. <laughs> so should we take it back? You alluded to it. It is now mm -hmm. 2022. So we thought it would be a fun idea to look at pickleball 10 years ago in 2012 with one of the top matches at a national championship, which featured uh, Tim, the puppet master Nelson, who is the namesake for the nasty Nelson, and also known for some on-court antics as John's showing on screen. And his partner, I believe Mona Burnett versus Gigi Lamaster and Steve Wong. Again, it's a USA Pickleball National Championship. And uh, we'll pull it up on the screen here. And I, we'll, we'll let Tim Nelson bring us in with the in, intro. Yeah. Well, whenever our podcast Nick gets his stuff together here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Tim Nelson was a top pro he kind of made a little bit of an appearance back a couple of years ago but he was a top pro known for a lot of antics but what we really want to look at in this 2012 matchup is what the game looked like 10 years ago uh this is going to be a tournament in arizona you're going to see a few fans so hopefully we see many more along the pro tours this year when it's which is going to be on fox sports and cbs sports uh hopefully we see pax stadium seating yeah, I mean, you can already tell this is the gold medal match, right, of the USA Pickleball Nationals. I mean, just and just look at the setting, right? It's crazy. You got the ref over there. He's wearing a fishing T-shirt and cargo shorts, right? And and I think what's also interesting is is just the age of the players that are on the court in the gold medal match, right? You have Tim Nelson is young. Right. I think at this point, you know, he's in his like lower 20s, mid mid 20s. And then every other player I think is in their 50s <laughs> or at least close to it. Right. And now the you know, arguably the number one female athlete on the tour is 14. And Ben Johns being the number one male athlete. I, I what is he? 22, John? I think so. Like 22 or 23 years old. Yeah. Something like that. And I think that's the norm, probably low twenties along the pro tour today. There's a couple older folks sprinkled in that are in the top talent. Like Matt Wright is in mid forties. Uh, but most yeah. I would say are in the, in their twenties for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, you even got some guys and girls in their, um, their lower thirties, right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With Tyson McGuffin is what, like 31, 32. Um, and still out there with the best, I think you're going to see that, that, I mean, really at anywhere from 18, I mean, Anna Lee and JW are kind of anomalies. I feel like with, you know, the Dylan Frazier's of the world, they're both, they're all young, but, um, I feel like you're going to see a lot of the top pros being in that mid twenties to early thirties. Um, and it's just crazy because. You, I mean, look, look at the game right here, right? There's the game's completely changing, you know, 
everyone's just dropping the ball in, getting in the little dink battles back and forth, right? Like when we first started learning pickleball five years ago, whenever we started, this is what pickleball was, right? It was just drop it into the kitchen, hit a dink cross court, and then eventually somebody makes a mistake, right? No, that's right. And if you watch too, it's uh, way less engaging from maybe the guys on the court. They, they're they not applying, or Tim, I think, did right there, but less pressure from the guys, less movement. There's less speed ups. We haven't seen a third shot drive yet in this match, I don't think. Uh, nope. It's much slower, slower pace uh, game for sure. Well, yeah. And I think what's interesting, I mean, Tim Nelson does... Uh, Put a little pressure more than Steve Wong does in this match. And it's probably just because he's the only young guy on the court. Um, but I think what's also interesting is the defense. Mm-hmm. Right now, you know, obviously all four of these players are, are good, right? And at that time, they were the best because this is the gold medal match in Nationals. But you can see how the talent has gotten so much better um, when you watch these players today as well as just every other pro on tour is that, you know, watch whenever they get stuck in a bad spot, they just throw up a lob. You know, there's no, like, there's not a lot of resetting into the kitchen off like a hard shot. I mean, that one was, but you'll see whenever someone gets put in trouble, they just put the ball way up high, you know, and then they just come back because that talent level just hasn't, gotten there yet at that time to be able to take any ball and put it perfectly in the kitchen where it can't be attacked back. Right. Look at the Newman's today, you know, they can right. take an overhead to the chest and the ball like just goes over the net. Right. <laughs> yeah. The points are much shorter. Uh, there's more unforced errors, frankly, than there are today. Today points last, you know, 50 shots is kind of a norm I, and better defense, keeping the point alive, but I wouldn't talk so so negative about the lob. I know they're not a lob, but just like fashion, everything seems to come back in style. And at the end of 2021, I know we saw a lot of lobs, uh, more offensive than what you're talking about here, John, with defensive lob. But I think that's going to be a recurring theme in 2022. Yep. And see, you see it here, right? They're just, yep. look at this. <laughs> I mean, I think the puppet masters, you know, messing around a little bit there doing his thing but um you saw from his partner there what's her name again mona, mona burnett mona um you could tell what she's back to our defense she just throws up a prayer and in today's game you throw something up like that to matt Wright, to ben to jay duvier i mean that ball's just not coming back right so the game yes. has just really evolved. And you're right about the unforced errors, too. Right. I will, watching this, there's sh- shots that you would never see missed today with by the top pros. There's definitely more unforced errors. I mean, and the points are so short. I can't, I can't remember how the last time a point was this short. It's usually like get to the line, hands battle, firefight, firefight, reset, reset, get back into the dink, and then you have another firefight. It just continues and continues. Yep. This is almost like what a I feel like today is kind of like a 4-5 match, right? Like the players can play, but there's still a lot of errors. Um, you know, a lot of dink errors, miss, miss returns, missed overheads, right? Um, so it just shows you how far we have come in what is this i don't know eight years or is it longer than 12 years 10 years 10 years 10 years math is hard Um, (laughs) i'm not i'm not in finance at all i promise (laughs) i know well that it just shows how much people are investing in pickleball how much time and the pros are really devoting to their craft and putting in the to get better and elevate the game and putting pressure on everybody else to keep up. Yep. And, you know, I did a little bit of research before this, Stacey. You know, I, I took a little little notes from you. Um, there wasn't even a senior, a senior division, open division at this point in USA Pickleball history. Oh, so interesting. There was, there was only one open division. 
probably because most of the players were older, right? They mm-hmm. didn't need it. Um, I don't think there was, if my uh, memory serves me right, I don't think there was even a senior level uh, open event at nationals until like 2015, which is probably when, you know, you had Kyle Yates at the top, right? Um, Tim Nelson, I believe, is still there. Aspen Kern, you mm-hmm. know, those guys. Uh, I think Callan Dawson was playing back then. Um, Morgan Evans, Tyson, you know, those guys are going to dominate a uh, <laughs> a senior pro match. Right. Um, well, and if I was over 50, I wouldn't want to play those guys for the national championship either. Yeah, no, I would not. Um, well, I would. I wouldn't mind being there playing against them. But if I was 50, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't want to. Um, I, another couple of things is one, the ball, it looks like the old soft indoor ball, which I think it was at that time. Right. Stacy. I'm not was, sure. To be honest, I actually might... thought it looked, the ball was the one thing that looked the same 10 years ago to oh, now, is it? <laughs> but you at, may I'm be right. I'm looking at him, hold it. And it looks like the Onyx, uh, maybe the pure or the fuse, whatever it was called or whatever it's still called that right but mm-hmm. it's definitely it doesn't seem like the dura but i might be wrong but one thing is for sure is that the paddle that tim nelson is using do you remember he came back he made a comeback in 2019 uh and partnered up with joey farius and he brought out the same paddle i do remember that because i think he played on the court next to us in in atlanta one time and i was like, what is that sound? Because I, I don't know if you can hear the sound of the live stream right now, but hitting the pickleball with the old school paddle versus maybe a, a new uh, graphite or composite, whatever you use paddle, it sounds completely different. And uh, he definitely used the same paddle. It, it, you may be able to see it on the live stream. It's a, pretty much a bright blue with a white spot exactly where you should hit the ball. He wore it out so much, and it definitely had a little bit of a rattle to it. Uh, but he was still using it. Yeah, it didn't sound like a very good paddle. Let's just put it that way. It sounded um, very old, and but he, I remember watching him at the U.S. Open. Him and Joey beat, uh, which I thought was you know pretty nostalgic. Was Marcin Rospetsky and Aspen Kern? They, you know, they played against them in the U.S. Open. Um, I think like the second round, and it was like this crazy good match. And you could tell that Tim Nelson still had it, even with his old $30 paddle or whatever it was. Right. Um, And I believe they beat Marson and Aspen and you could just tell that Tim was still the same, drop the ball in, dink it around. And there wasn't really much else. And um, it's just cool to see that he was still able to compete even after such a long layoff. No, I agree. I think the one thing that's really changed from 2012 to now is how much more offensive you need to be. I think playing this game, being able to drop the ball, move it around, be creative, it can get you into the top level. But to really excel, you need to have some power and offensive shots to to win the point. Yeah, and I think uh, defensively too, you need to be a little more aggressive on the defense side where, you know, I think I remember watching Tim Nelson uh, at the U S open, you know, they would speed up at him and he would just, just soft hand everything back. Right. So, you know, you have those players, Stacy, you're one of them. People will sit there and just tee off on you. I mean, you'll get every ball back. Right. But they'll like just tee off because they're not like putting any pressure back on the block. Right. Yep. So um, where now you see it, a lot of players where you speed up at them and it comes back just as hard, if not harder, you know, to send a message, be like, Hey, you know, you're not going to get me like this. Right. I'm going to push it back down your throat. Um, So I think, yeah, I think every, I think everybody's getting the ball back now. Right. So defense, as you said earlier is, insane these days everybody is getting the ball back so you need to win the point you need to hit something that is out of their reach they can't return versus just making a good shot 
and also it, it's um just like the control of the point mm -hmm. right so you know you don't want to be the one that's always being attacked you know and you want to be able to control the pace control where the ball's going um oh another little unforced error there by uh tim trying to be a little cute <laughs> but, well um, what, what's interesting here john actually is Mona and Tim on the near side closest to us have been on the number 10, I, you know, pickleball play to 11 points, the number 10 people get stuck all the time. I think they were up 10, at I, least 10, three, yes. uh, and S Steve and Gigi rattle some points all the way back. And after many sides, a few sides out, we're still at 10. Uh, so even back then and today, I feel like no, the, getting to the final point is always the hardest. So some things stay the same. Yeah, that is true. You know, you start playing a little more tight. Uh, you almost played not to mess up yeah. instead of playing the way that got you to 10. Um, or if you're Tim Nelson, maybe you play to hit a hero shot or be creative, make your opponents look kind of silly. So you can do your, your celebratory puppet master routine. <laughs> yep, exactly. And then, you know, see, you see the defense here. I mean, there are still lobs on, on defense if you're in trouble. But look mm -hmm. at ev almost every single, well, besides that one, almost every single defensive shot is just throw it up. Um, and you don't see that as much. Now the players have the skill to be able to put it right back in the kitchen so they can get back up. Um, and I guess a little pro tip if you're in that position and your only shot is the defensive lob throw it up super high as long as the wind's not up that day, give you more time to get ready for the next one. Yeah, that is true. And then you have Tim Nelson here. Oh man. I love the video, his highlight video that he has, right. Where he like introduces it. Like, you know, like the heart of a champion by looking into his eyes. And it's just like him talking over it. And he's just, it's just a highlight video of just him just being the puppet master to people. You know, and got he's quite the character, and I wish I would have been able to play him. Uh, maybe someday. Maybe he'll make another comeback. I wouldn't mind it because personally, I really like the personalities in pickleball. Uh, I think Tyson does a really good job of showing his personality. People feel like they know him. He's fun to watch. Uh, Riley Newman, I think, is another one. Like that's what makes pickleball exciting, right? Is the emotion maybe a little bit of on-court antics along the way. Definitely. It makes it more exciting, right? Like people like seeing drama. That's why yeah. Bravo is such, such a big hit, you know, <laughs> like people love watching Bravo because the drama. So you bring the drama to sports and you bring that, uh, on-court behavior. Uh, pickleball would not be as exciting to watch if nobody said a word. Right. So, and nobody, you know, gave a fist pump and they just scored a point and walked back to the line. So you love yeah. to see the you love to see the personality. And he was definitely one of the first ones that brought a lot of personality. Uh, well, think about it. The nasty Nelson is created because of Tim Nelson, or at least named after him, uh, which I guess you don't see too many in, in the pro tour or on the streams and stuff, but every once in a while, or maybe in rec play, it's uh fun, fun to whip that out. I, t I tell you before we go here stays the one there is a funny story of Zane Affleck who as I'm sure you know has quite the personality himself um it was Atlanta 2019 and Joey and um Tim Nelson were playing together and it was first or second round and Zane Affleck told Joey said hey I'm gonna nasty Nelson Tim Nelson first point and I'm going to get like a 10 ounce paddle, right? And I'm just going to smoke them with it. And sure enough, there was a video out there. I don't remember who posted it. it Might've been like Tyler Lung or something had a video of it, but he smoked Tim Nelson with it. And Tim took his glasses and like threw them off. This is point one. You know, it's, it was hilarious to watch it be done to him because you could tell he was not a fan. <laughs> I guess everything uh, goes in circles, right? What comes around goes around. Yeah. I mean, and I think <laughs> I, I, I don't remember 
oh, I think it was uh, Zane then went to do a Nasty Nelson on Sarah Ansbury the same weekend. So he was just, he was taking Tim Nelson's uh, thunder there. <laughs> right out of his playbook. Yep, exactly. So I guess to bring it back to today, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on the trends or things to watch out for, for 2022? Well, I think the, the sport is just getting bigger, better, faster, stronger, and smarter. You know, as you can see in that one match there, and even it's starting to be the shift within the last year or so, is you're seeing a lot more drives early on, right? So there, you know, you drop the ball, you get in. Now you're seeing big drives from the baseline, then working your way in, right? So I think you're going to see a lot more aggressive play from just these athletes getting better. Um, and I think the competition as a whole, depth-wise, is getting a lot better. I'm not going to say that Ben is going to not be the number one player, because I still think he will be. But I think you're going to see a lot more players giving him a harder time. I don't think it's going to be as easy for him and some of the other top players as it has been over the last couple of years because of the money. People are taking it way more seriously. Um, just the whole, you know, it's just going to get more competitive and I'm here for it. No, I agree. I think you're right. Uh, there's been a trend in the, even in the past few years, third shot drive, fifth shot drop. You're even seeing it on the rec level courts. And I think that's a good strategy. I think that with more money, more people are going to be intrigued with the sport, a more visibility because of the broadcasts on Fox sports, ESPN, CBS, all that you'll, you'll get influenced more, more people from maybe the tennis world will be influenced to come into the pickleball world. Uh, which, to your point, will be more competition. I think there'll be some more interesting strategies come back. Anna Lee whipped out the, or brought back maybe the lob serve uh, at nationals. I think things like that, we, which we haven't seen. I, we haven't really seen the lob serve. She, she pretty much did it on every serve because it was super effective. So you'll see new strategies or maybe reinvented old strategies come to life this year. And I think, to your point, a lot of drama. I think there'll be a lot of interesting storylines between the tours, between the growth of the sport. There's a big announcement for the APP at their APP Masters later this month in a couple weeks. And then followed by PPA, not to be outdone, will have their own announcement. Sounds like at the beginning of February. So it'll be a lot of that back and forth, I think, all year long. Yeah, it's going to be very competitive amongst the tours, and nobody should be surprised by it. Um, but like I said at the beginning, as long as the player's best interests are put first and they make money, I'm here for it. Yeah. And the sport, I think the sport yeah. itself, the, in February, the sports and fitness industry association numbers will come out last year. They reported 4.2 million players, which was like a 21% growth over the previous year, hoping for another big number keep pickleball at the fastest growing sport in the country status uh and i just think it's just going to continue to snowball yeah it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger i'm sure it's going to be quite the big jump you see it at all the rec level courts now um all the tournaments are selling out every single one of them um but just at your rec courts there's a hundred people waiting you know so now the cities and uh private companies need to uh really invest in some infrastructure to meet the demand. So how do you deal with that? If you're a rec player show up, there's a ton of players. What are you, what are you doing? If I'm going to rec play, you're going to rec play. There's a lines of people waiting. What do you do? It really depends. So podcast Nick on here, right? I will go out with him and play rec play. Um, just, because it's fun to like play around with your friends sometimes um, and not be serious. But if I'm going to courts and they're full, I'm leaving. You know, so it's it's tough. You know, the, rec the, the courts where I'm at in Jacksonville are getting very, very busy where 
somebody could be sitting out for, you know, uh, 20, 30 minutes between games. But it's just interesting because there's different cultures everywhere you go, right? It's a, you know, a lot of these places are public courts, so people can really do whatever they want. You mm-hmm. know, like if I get to a court and I'm there at seven o'clock in the morning and we're playing a game, I, I'm not, I don't feel I should be told I have to get off to share with other people. Right. But at the same time, you want people to play. So, you know, you have to have some rotation, I guess. I don't know. It's a mess. We have, we have too many people, not enough courts. <laughs> the good news is I looked at the the numbers. I don't know if it was quite 10 years ago, but. In the last decade, the courts have like quadrupled, if not more, the number of available courts. And I thought, I, I think I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but I follow like the pickleball news. And every day I get at least five to 10 alerts that say new courts are coming or new money's invested here. There's anonymous donors to get these, this city courts or that city courts. I think the infrastructure is going to continue to grow. And that's the number one thing probably preventing growth for the sport is courts because it's hard to play two games in an hour or, or two hours when you show up to play. Um, but on the other, on the flip side, it's nice to see so many people wanting to join the community. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, more the merrier, as long as we get more courts. <laughs> or maybe like at least some more temp nets and spaces to put them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wish I had a place I could build my own private one, but I don't, so... Not where yet. Hoping, that's where I'm hoping some, you know, some sponsors for the Pickler podcast come in. You know, I know. Come play with John, the People's Champ, Davison. Just give him a court. Play with him anytime you want. Yeah, just give me a couple thousand dollars so I can uh, build my own, and then you can come play with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stace, it's been fun. I know. Unless, First, anything else you want to talk about? But it's a good start to 2022. I think so too. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about this year. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a lot to share over at thepickler.com and in the newsletter. And we'll keep up rolling right here with Pickler, the podcast with me, Stacey Townsend and John, the people's champ Davis. You. All right, Stacey. We should take him out. Yep. Pickler out.